Hi everyone, welcome to um, module 8.3 and here we're going to be talking about an introductory uh, segment to the spinal cord, the spinal nerves, and the spinal reflexes. Keep in mind that most of this information was covered generally in module 8.1, so this is just a very detailed account of what we talked about there. So spinal reflexes are quick autonomic responses triggered by specific stimuli. Spinal reflexes are controlled in the spinal cord and they can function without any input from the brain. For example, a reflex controlled in the spinal cord makes you drop a frying pan that you didn't realize was sizzling hot. Before the information reaches your brain and you become aware of the pain, you've already released the pan. And there are much more complex spinal reflexes, but this functional pattern still applies. Your spinal cord is structurally and functionally integrated with your brain. So the adult spinal cord is approximately 45 centimeters or 18 inches long with a maximum width of roughly 14 millimeters. Note that the cord itself is not as long as the vertebral column. Instead, the spinal cord ends um, between uh, the vertebrae L1 and L2. The posterior dorsal surface of the spinal cord has a shallow longitudinal groove and the posterior medial sulcus and the anterior medium fissure is a deep groove along the anterior ventral surface. The amount of gray matter is greatest in segments of the spinal cord dedicated to the sensory and motor control of the limbs. And these segments are expanded, forming the enlargements of the spinal cord, and the cervical enlargement supplies nerves to the shoulder and the upper limbs. The lumbar enlargement provides innervation to the structures of the pelvis and the lower limbs. Inferior to the lumbar enlargement, the spinal cord becomes tapered um, and conical, and this region is the conus medullaris. The phylum terminale is a slender uh, strand of fibrous tissue and extends from the inferior tip of the conus medullaris. It continues along the length of the vertebral canal as far as the second sacral vertebrae, where it provides longitudinal support to the spinal cord as a component of the coccygeal ligament. The entire spinal cord can be divided into 31 segments on the basis of the origin of the spinal nerves. A letter and number designation, the same as the method used to identify vertebrae, identify each of these segments. Every spinal segment is associated with a pair of dorsal root ganglia located near the spinal cord. These ganglia contain the cell bodies of sensory neurons. The axons of the neurons form the dorsal, dorsal roots, which bring sensory information into the spinal cord. A pair of ventral roots contains the axons of motor neurons that extend in the periphery to control somatic and visceral effectors. On both sides, the dorsal and ventral roots of each segment pass between the vertebral canal and the periphery at the intervertebral foramen between the successive vertebrae. The dorsal root ganglion lies between the pedicles of the adacent vertebrae. Distal to each dorsal root ganglion, the sensory and motor roots are bound together into a single spinal nerve, and spinal nerves are classified as mixed nerves. That is, they contain both afferent, which is the sensory, and the efferent, which are the motor fibers. As I said, there are 31 pairs of those spinal nerves, and each is identified by the association with adjacent vertebrae. And for example, we may speak of the cervical spinal nerves or even the cervical nerves. We may make a general reference to the spinal nerves of the neck. However, when we indicate specific spinal nerves, it's customary to give them a regional number. Each spinal nerve inferior to the thoracic vertebrae takes its name from the vertebrae immediately superior to it. For example, spinal nerve T1 emerges immediately inferior to the vertebrae T1 Spinal nerve T2 follows the vertebrae T2, and so forth. The arrangement differs in the cervical region, and there, are, um, there, the first pair of spinal nerves, C1, passes between the skull and the first cervical vertebrae. And for this region, each cervical nerve takes its name from the vertebrae immediately inferior to it. In other words, cervical nerve C2 precedes vertebra C2, and the same system is used for the rest of the cervical series. The transition from one numbering system to another occurs between the last cervical vertebrae and the first thoracic vertebrae. The spinal nerve found at this location has been designated C8. And therefore, although there are only seven cervical vertebrae, there are eight cervical nerves. The spinal cord continues to enlarge and elongate until a person is approximately four years old. Up until that time, enlargement of the spinal cord keeps pace with the growth of the vertebral column. Through this period, the ventral and dorsal roots are very short, and they enter the vertebral form formina immediately adjacent to their spinal segment. After age four, the vertebral column continues to elongate, but the spinal cord does not. This vertebral growth moves the intervertebral forma, and thus the spinal nerves, farther and farther from their original positions relative to the spinal cord. As a result, the dorsal and ventral roots 
gradually elongate and the correspondence between the spinal segments and the vertebral segment is lost. For example, in adults, the sacral segments of the spinal cord are at the levels of vertebral or vertebrae L1 and L2. The spinal cord extends only to the level of the first or second lumbar vertebrae, but the dorsal and ventral roots of those spinal segments, um, L2 to S5, extend inferiorly past the inferior tip of the conus medullaris. And when seen in gross dissection, the phylum terminale and the long ventral and dorsal roots resemble a horse's tail. And for this reason, early anatomists call this complex the cauda equina, which just simply means horse's tail. The vertebral column and its surrounding ligaments, tendons, and muscles isolate the spinal cord from the rest of the body. These structures also protect against bumps and shocks to the skin of the back, and the delicate neural tissues must also be protected from damaging contacts with the surrounding bony walls of the vertebral canal. The spinal meninges are a series of specialized membranes surrounding the spinal cord, and they provide the necessary physical stability and shock absorption. Blood vessels branching within these layers deliver oxygen and nutrients to the spinal cord. The spinal meninges consist of three layers, the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. At the form and magnum of the skull, the spinal meninges are continuous with the cranial meninges, which surround the brain. Bacterial or viral infections can cause meningitis or inflammation of the meningeal membranes. Meningitis is dangerous because it can disrupt the normal circulation of cerebral spinal fluid, which damages or kills neurons and organelia in the infected areas. An initial diagnosis may specify the meninges of the spinal cord, or spinal meningitis, or the brain, cerebral meningitis, but in later stages, the entire meningeal system is usually affected. So we'll talk about the dura mater here. Um, so the tough fibrous dura mater is the layer that forms the outermost covering of the spinal cord. And this layer contains dense collagen fibers that are oriented along the longitudinal axis of the cord. Between the dura mater and the walls of the vertebral canal lies the epidural space, which is a region that contains the areolar tissue, blood vessels, and the protective padding of adipose tissue. The spinal dura mater does not have extensive firm connections to the surrounding vertebrae. Attachment sites at either end of the vertebral canal can provide longitudinal stability. Cranially, the outermost layer of the spinal dura mater fuses with the periosteum of the occipital bone around the margins of the form and magnum. There, spinal dura mater becomes continuous with the cranial dura mater. Within the sacral canal, the spinal dura mater uh, tapers to form a sheath to a dense cord of collagen fibers that blends with the components of the phylum terminale to form the coccygeal ligament. Aerial connective tissue and adipose tissue within the epidural space support the spinal dura mater. In addition, this dura mater extends between the adjacent uh, vertebrae at each intervertebral foramen. which fuses with the connective tissue that surround the spinal nerves. So the arachnoid matter. In this anatomical and tissue specimens, a narrow subdural space separates the dura mater from the deeper meningeal layers. In a healthy living person, no such space exists. Instead, the inner surface of the dura mater is in contact with the outer surface of the arachnoid mater in the middle meningeal layer. The inner surface of the dura mater and the outer surface of the arachnoid matter are covered by simple squamous epithelium. And the arachnoid matter includes this epithelium called the arachnoid membrane and the arachnoid trabeculae, which is a delicate network of collagen and elastic fibers that extend between the arachnoid membrane and the outer surface of the pia matter. The region between is called the subarachnoid space and it's filled with cerebral spinal fluid, which acts as a shock absorber and a diffusion medium for dissolved gases, nutrients, and chemical messengers and wastes. The spinal arachnoid mater extends inferiorly as far as the phylum terminale, and the dorsal and ventral roots of the cauda equina lie between the fluid filled subarachnoid space. In adults, the withdrawal of the cerebral spinal fluid involves the insertion of the needle into the subarachnoid space in the inferior lumbar region. This procedure is known as a lumbar puncture or a spinal tap. So the pia matter, the subarachnoid space extends between the arachnoid epithelium and the innermost men, uh, meningeal layer. The pia matter, so the pia matter consists of a mess work of elastic and collagen fibers and is firmly bound to the underlying neural tissue. These connective tissue fibers are extensively interwoven with those that span the subarachnoid space, firmly binding the arachnoid to the pia matter. 
the blood vessels servicing the spinal cord. They run along the surface of the spinal pi matter within the subarachnoid space. Along the length of the spinal cord, paired ventriculate ligaments extend from the pi matter through the arachnoid matter to the dura mater. Ventriculate ligaments, which originate along either side of the spinal matter um, or of the spinal cord, prevent lateral or side to side movement. The dural connections at the form and magnum and the coccygeal ligament prevent longitudinal or superior slash inferior movement. The spinal meninges accompany the dorsal and ventral roots as these roots pass through the intervertebral foramen. So the meningeal membranes are continuous with the connective tissue that also surround the spinal nerves and the peripheral branches. So we can relate the functional organization of the spinal cord to its sectional organization. And together, the anterior medial fissure and the posterior median sulcus divide the spinal cord into left and right sides. Gray matter forms an H or butterfly shape and surrounds the neural central canal. Horns are the areas of gray matter on either side of the spinal cord. And the gray matter is dominated by cell bodies of the neurons, neuro, uh, neuroglia, and the unmyelinated axons. The superficial white matter contains large numbers of myelinated and unmyelinated axons. So speaking on the organization of gray matter, <clears throat> we can ask the question, how is the gray matter functionally organized within the nervous system as a whole? And nuclei are masses of gray matter within the central nervous system. Sensory nuclei receive and relay sensory information from peripheral receptors. Motor nuclei issue motor commands to the peripheral effectors. Sensory and motor nuclei appear in small transverse sections, but they may extend for a considerable distance along the length of the spinal cord. A frontal section along the length of the central canal of the spinal cord separates the sensory nuclei from the motor nuclei. The posterior gray horns contain somatic and sensory sensory nuclei, and the anterior gray horns contain somatic motor nuclei. The lateral gray horns, located only in the thoracic and lumbar segments, contain visceral motor neuri. The gray commissures, uh, posterior and anterior to the central canal, contain axons that form one side of the cord to the other before they reach an area in the gray matter. The nuclei within the gray horn are also um, spatially organized. In the cervical enlargement, for example, the anterior horns contain nuclei whose motor neurons control the muscles of the upper limbs. On each side of the spinal cord, in meter lateral sequence, are somatic nuclei that control, one, the muscles that position the pectoral girdle, two, the muscles that move the arm, uh, three, the muscles that move the forearm and the hand, and four, the muscles that move the hand and the fingers. Within each of these regions, the motor neurons that control flexor muscles are grouped separately from those that control extensor muscles. Because the spinal cord is so highly organized, we can predict which muscles will be affected by damage to a specific area of the gray matter. Getting into the organization of white matter, how is the white matter functionally organized? Uh, so the white matter on either side of the spinal cord can be divided into three regions called columns or funiculi. The posterior white columns lie between the posterior gray horns and the posterior medial sulcus. The anterior white columns lie between the anterior gray horns and the anterior medial fissure. The anterior white columns are interconnected by the anterior white commissure, which is a region where axons cross from one side of the spinal cord to another. The white matter between the anterior and posterior columns on either side makes up the lateral white column. Each column contains tracts whose axons share functional and structural characteristics. So a tract, or a fasciculus, is a bundle of axons in CNS that is somewhat uniform in diameter, myelination, and propagation speed. All the axons within a tract rely on the same type of information in the same direction. Short tracts carry sensory or motor signals between the segments of the spinal cord, and larger tracts connect the spinal cord with the brain. Ascending tracts carry sensory information toward the brain, and descending tracts convey motor commands to the spinal cord. Because spinal tracts have very specific functions, damage to one produces a char characteristic loss of sensation or motor control. Every segment of the spinal cord is connected to a pair of spinal nerves. Surrounding each spinal nerve is a series of connected tissue layers continuous with those of the associated peripheral nerves. These layers are best seen in sectional view and are comparable to those associated with skeletal muscles.
The epineurium, or the outermost layer, consists of a dense network of collagen fibers. The fibers of the perineurium, or the middle layer, extend inward from the epineurium, and these connective tissue partitions divide the nerve into a series of compartments that contain bundles of axon or fascicles. Delicate connective tissues um, or tissue fibers of the endoneurium or the innermost layer extend from the perineurium and surround the individual axons. Arteries and veins penetrate the epineurium and branch within the perineurium. Capillaries leave in the perineurium branch into the endoneurium. And they supply axons and Schwann cells of the nerves and the fibroblasts of the connective tissues. As spinal nerves extend in the periphery, they branch and interconnect, forming the peripheral nerves that innervate body tissues and organs. The connective tissue sheets of peripheral nerves are the same as, and continuous with, those of spinal nerves. If a peripheral axon is severed but not displaced, a normal function may eventually return as the cut stump grows across the site of injury away from the cell body and along its former path. Repairs made after an entire peripheral nerve has been damaged are generally incomplete, primarily due to problems with the axon alignment and regrowth. Various technological sophisticated procedures designed to improve nerve regeneration and repair are currently under evaluation. However, we haven't developed a full process for this. So a dermatome is the specific bilateral region of the skin surface monitored by a single pair of spinal nerves. Each pair of spinal nerves supplies its own dermatome, and note that the boundaries of adjacent dermatomes overlap to some degree. So dermatomes are clinically important because the damage or infection of a spinal nerve or a dorsal root ganglion produces a loss of sensation in the corresponding region of the skin. Additionally, characteristic signs may appear on the skin supplied by that specific nerve. Peripheral nerve palsies or peripheral nerve neuropathies are regional losses of sensory and motor function, often resulting in nerve trauma or compression. So if your arm or your leg has fallen asleep after you lean or sat against an uncomfortable position, you may have experienced a mild temporary palsy. The location of the affected dermatomes provides a clue to the location of injuries along the spinal cord, but information is not precise, and more exact conclusions can be drawn if there's a loss of motor control based on the origin and distribution of the peripheral nerves originating at, at the nerve plexus. And this can be traced in four steps. One, the sympathetic nerve carries sensory information from the visceral organs. Two, the ventral ramus carries uh, sensory information from the ventral lateral body surface, the structures of the body wall and the limbs. Three, the dorsal ramus carries sensory information from the skin and the skeletal muscles of the back. And four, the dorsal root of each spinal nerve carries sensory information to the spinal cord. So the spinal nerve forms just lateral to the inner vertebral foramen where the dorsal and ventral roots unite. And we'll consider the pathways of both sensory information and the motor commands. So speaking a little on nerve plexuses, the simple distribution of pattern of a dorsal and ventral rami or branches applies to spinal nerves T1 through L2. But in segments controlling the skeletal musculature of the neck, upper limbs, and lower limbs, the situation is more complicated. During development, the small skeletal muscles innervated by different ventral rami typically fuse to form larger muscles within the compound regions. The anatomical distinctions between the component um, muscles may disappear, but separate ventral rami uh, continue to provide sensory innervation and motor control to each part of the compound muscle. As they converge, the ventral rami of adjacent spinal nerves blend their fibers, producing a series of compound nerve trunks. Such a complex interwoven network of nerves is called a nerve plexus. Only the ventral rami form plexuses, and these four major plexuses are the cervical plexus, the brachial plexus, the lumbar plexus, and the sacral plexus. The nerves arising from or at these plexuses contain sensory as well as motor fibers because the nerves form from the fusion of ventral rami. The cervical plexus consists of the ventral rami of spinal nerves C1 through C5, 
and the branches of the cervical plexus innervate the muscles of the neck and extend to the thoracic cavity where they control the um, diaphragmatic muscles. The phrenic nerve is the major nerve of the cervical plexus. The left and right phrenic nerves supply the diaphragm, which is a key respiratory muscle. Other branches of this nerve plexus are distributed to the skin of the neck and the superior part of the chest. The brachial plexus innervates the pectoral girdle and the upper limb with contributions from the ventral rami of the spinal nerves C5 through T1. The brachial plexus can also have fibers from C4, T2, or both. The nerves that form this plexus originate from trunks and cords, and trunks are large bundles of axons from several spinal nerves. Cords are smaller branches that originate in the trunks. And we name both trunks and cords according to their location relative to the axillary artery, a large artery that supplies the upper limb. Hence, we have superior middle and inferior trunks and lateral medial and posterior cords. The lateral cord forms the musculocutaneous nerve exclusively and together with the medial cord contributes to the median nerve. The ulnar nerve is the other major nerve of the medial cord. The posterior cord gives rise to the axillary nerve and the radial nerve. So the lumbar plexus and the sacral plexus arise from the lumbar and sacral segments of the spinal cord respectively. The nerves arising at these plexuses innervate the pelvic girdle and the lower limbs. The lumbar plexus contains axons from the ventral rami and spinal nerves T12 through L4. And the major nerves of this plexus are the gentiofemoral nerve, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, and the, fem and the femoral nerve. The sacral plexus contains axons from the ventral rami and spinal nerves L4 through S4. And two major nerves arise from this plexus, the sciatic nerve and the pudendal nerve. The sciatic nerve passes posterior to the femur, deep to the long head of the biceps femoris muscle. As it approaches the knee, the sciatic nerve divides into two branches, the fibular nerve and the tibial nerve. The sural nerve formed from branches of the fibular nerve is a sensory nerve innervating the lateral portion of the foot. A section of this nerve is often removed for use in nerve grafts. Discussions of motor performance usually make a distinction between the conscious ability to control motor function, something that requires communication and feedback between the brain and spinal cord, and autonomic um, or automatic motor responses coordinated entirely with the spinal cord. And these automatic responses, called reflexes, are motor responses to specific stimuli. So your body has about 10 million sensory neurons, one half million motor neurons, and 20 billion inner neurons. The sensory neurons deliver information to the CNS, and the motor neurons distribute, uh, distrib uh, distribute commands to peripheral effectors such as skeletal muscles. Interactions among inner neurons provide the interpretation, planning, and the coordinating of incoming and outgoing signals. The billions of inner neurons of the CNS are organized into much smaller number of neuronal pools, which are functional groups of interconnected neurons. A neuronal pool may be scattered, involving neurons in several regions of the brain or localized, with neurons restricted to one specific location in the brain or the spinal cord. Estimates of the actual number of neuronal pools range between a few hundred and a few thousand. Each pool has a limited number of input sources and output destinations, and each pool may contain both excitatory and inhibitory neurons. The input of the entire neuronal pool may uh, stimulate or depress activity in other parts of the brain or spinal cord, affecting the interpretation of sensory information or the coordination of muscle commands. The pattern of interaction among the neurons provides clues to the functional characteristic of a neuronal pool, and we can distinguish five circuit patterns. One, divergence is the spread of information from the neuron to several neurons, or from one pool to multiple pools. Divergence prevents the broad distribution of a specific input. Considerable divergence occurs when sensory neurons bring information to the CNS because the information is distributed to neuronal pools throughout the spinal cord and brain. Visual information arriving from the eyes, for example, reaches your conscience at the same time it is distributed to the areas of the brain that control posture and balance at the subconscious level. And two, in convergence, several neuron synapses on a single um, postsynaptic neuron uh, Several patterns of activity in the presynaptic neurons can therefore have the same effect on the postsynaptic neuron. Through convergence, the same motor neurons can be subject to both conscious and subconscious control. For example, the movements of your diaphragm and ribs are now being controlled by your brain at the subconscious level. But you can also consciously control the same motor neurons as when you take a deep breath and hold it.
two neuronal pools are involved while synapsing on the same motor neurons. Three, the serial processing information is relayed in a stepwise fashion from one neuron to another from one neuronal pool to the next. And this pattern occurs as sensory information is relayed from one part of the brain to another. For example, pain sensations on the way to your consciousness may stop at two neuronal pools on the pain pathway. Four, parallel processing occurs when several neurons or neuronal pools process the same information simultaneously. Divergence must take place before parallel processing can occur. As a result, many responses can occur simultaneously. For example, stepping on a sharp object stimulates sensory neurons that distribute the information to several neuronal pools. As a result of parallel processing, you might withdraw your foot, shift your weight, move your arms, or feel the pain and shout, ouch, at all about the same time. And five, in reverberation, collateral branches of the axon somewhere along the circuit extend back towards the source of an impulse and further stimulate the presynaptic neurons. Reverberation is like a positive feedback loop that involves neurons. Once a reverberating circuit has been activated, it will continue to function until synaptic T or inhibitory stimuli break that cycle. Reverberation can take place within a single neuronal pool and may involve a series of interconnected pools. Highly complicated examples of reverberation among neuronal pools in the brain may help maintain consciousness, muscular coordination, and normal breathing. The functions of the nervous system depend on the interactions among the neurons organized in neuronal pools, and the most complex neural processing steps take place in the spinal cord in the brain. The simplest steps occur within the PNS and the spinal cord, and these steps control reflexes that are a bit like Legos. Individually, the reflexes are quite simple, but they can be combined in a great variety of ways to uh, create complex responses. For this reason, reflexes are the basic building blocks of uh, neural function, and we'll discuss that as we get further on. Conditions inside or outside the body can change rapidly and unexpectedly. And reflexes are rapid autonomic responses to specific stimuli. Reflexes preserve homeostasis by making rapid adjustment in the function of organs or organ systems. The response shows little variability. Each time a particular reflex is activated, it normally produces the same motor response. The route followed by a nerve impulse to produce a reflex is called a reflex arc. And we just can discuss that in five uh, steps. One, the arrival of a stimulus and activation of the receptor. Reflex ARPs begin with activation of the receptor, which may be specialized cells or uh, the dendrites of sensory neurons. Receptors are sensitive to physical or chemical changes in the body um, or to changes in the external environment. If you lean on attack, for example, pain receptors in the palm of your hand are activated. And these receptors of the dendrites of sensory neurons respond to stimuli that cause or accompany tissue damage. Two, the activation of sensory neurons. When the dendrites are stretched, there is a graded depolarization that leads to the formation and propagation of action potentials along the axons along of the sensory neurons. This information reaches the spinal cord by way of a dorsal route. In our example, they also involve the same cell. However, the two steps may involve different cells. For example, reflex is triggered by loud sounds begin when receptor cells in the internal ear release neurotransmitters that stimulate sensory neurons. Three, information process in the CNS. In our example, information processing begins when excitatory neurotransmitter molecules released by the axon terminal of the sensory neuron arrive at the postsynaptic membrane of the interneuron. The neurotransmitter that produces the excitatory postsynaptic potential, or EPSP, which is integrated with other stimuli arriving at the postsynaptic cell at that moment. The information processing is thus performed by the interneuron. In the simplest reflexes, such as the stretch reflex, the sensory neuron innervates the motor neuron directly. And in that case, the motor neuron performs the information processing. By contrast, complex reflexes involve several interneurons. Some release excitatory neurotransmitters, and others release inhibitory neurotransmitters. Four, the activation of a motor neuron. The axons of the stimulated uh, motor neurons carry action potentials to the periphery, in this example, to the ventral root of the spinal nerve. Five, the responses of a peripheral effector. The release of neurotransmitter by the motor neurons at an axon terminal then leads to a response by a peripheral effector, in this case, a skeletal muscle whose contraction pulls your hand away from the tack. A reflex response generally removes or opposes the original stimulus, 
And this is an example of negative feedback. However, reflexes may be integrated to produce complex movements that support or enhance the primary response. By opposing potentially harmful changes in internal or external environments, reflexes play an important role in homeostasis. The immediate reflex response is typical not only of the response to a stimulus. The other responses, which are directed by your brain, involve multiple synapses and take longer to organize and coordinate. So the nature of the resulting motor response, the complexity of the neural circuit involved, or the site of information processes uh, are all categories that are not mutually exclusive. They represent different ways in describing a single reflex. Um, these are all of the four classifications of the reflex. Um, my apologies, uh, we excluded early development in that. And speaking of that development of reflexes, the innate reflexes result from the connections that form between neurons during that development. Such reflexes generally appear in the predictable sequence from the simplest reflex response, such as withdrawal from pain, to more complex motor neurons, such as uh, chewing, suckling, or tracking of objects with the eye. The neural connections responsible for the basic motor patterns of innate reflexes are genetically programmed. Examples include the ref uh, the reflex of the removal of your hand from a hot stovetop and blinking when your eyelashes are touched. More complex learned motor patterns are called acquired reflexes. For example, an experienced driver steps on the brake when trouble appears ahead, or a professional skier makes equally quick adjustments in the body positioning while racing. These motor responses are rapid and automatic, but they were learned rather than pre-established. Repetition enhances such reflexes. The distinction between innate and acquired reflexes is not absolute. Some people can learn motor patterns more quickly than others, and the differences probably have some genetic basis. Most reflexes, whether innate or acquired, can be modified over time or suppressed through conscious effort. For example, while walking a tightrope of the Grand Canyon, you might ignore a bee sting on your hand. Under other circumstances, you would probably withdraw your hand immediately while shouting and flailing about. So the nature of the response. Somatic Reflexes provide a mechanism for the involuntary control of the muscular system. Superficial reflexes are triggered by stimuli at the skin or the mucous membranes. Stress reflexes are triggered by the sudden elongation of a tendon and thus the muscle to which it attaches. A familiar example is the patellar or the knee jerk reflex that is usually tested during physical exams. These re reflexes are also known as deep tendon reflexes or myotic reflexes. Visceral reflexes or autonomic reflexes control the activity of other systems. We consider somatic reflexes in detail a little bit later on. The movements directed by somatic reflexes are either delicate uh, or neither delicate nor precise. So you might wonder why they exist at all, because we have voluntary control over the same muscles. In fact, somatic reflexes are absolutely vital, primarily because they are immediate. Making decisions and coordinating um, voluntary responses takes time. In an emergency, when you slip while walking down a flight of stairs or accidentally press your hand against a knife edge, any delay increases the likelihood of severe injury. Thus, somatic reflexes provide a rapid response that can be modified later, if necessary, by voluntary muscle commands. Speaking a little bit about the complexity of the circuit, monosynaptic reflexes involve the simplest reflex arc. Most reflexes are complicated and have at least one inner neuron between the sensory neuron and the motor neuron. And these types are called polysynaptic reflexes. Polysynaptic reflexes have a longer delay between the stimulus and the response. The length of delay is proportional to the number of the synapses involved. Speaking on processing sites and spinal reflexes, the important interconnections and processing events occur in the spinal cord. So spinal reflexes range in complexity from simple monosynaptic reflexes involving a single segment of the spinal cord to polysynaptic reflexes that involve many segments. And the most complicated spinal reflexes, called intersegmental reflex arcs, many segments interact to produce coordinated, highly variable motor responses. In monosynaptic reflexes, there's a little delay between the sensory and input motor control or output. These reflexes control the most rapid, stereotyped, motor responses of the nervous system to specific stimuli. So the stretch reflex, best known as the monosynaptic reflex, is the stretch reflex, um, which autonomically regulates skeletal muscle length. The knee jerk or patellar reflex is an example. When a physician taps your patellar tendon with a reflex hammer, receptors in the quadricep muscles are stretched.
The distortion of the receptors in turn stimulates sensory neurons that extend into the spinal cord, where they synapse um, on motor neurons that control the motor uh, units of the stretch muscle. This leads to a reflexive contraction of the stretch muscle that extends to the knee in a brief kick. So to summarize, the stimulus activates a sensory neuron, which triggers an intermediate motor response that counteracts the stimulus. The entire reflex is completed within about 20 to 40 milliseconds because the axon potentials traveling towards and away from the spinal cord are conducted along large myelinated type A fibers. The receptors in stretch reflexes are called the muscle spindles. Um, the stretching of the muscle spindles produces a sudden burst of activity in the sensory neurons that monitor them. This in turn leads to a stimulation of motor neurons that control the motor neur uh, units of the stretch muscle. The result is a rapid muscle shortening which returns the muscle spindles to their resting length. The rate of action potential generation in the sensory neurons then decreases, causing a drop in muscle tone and resting levels. Speaking a little bit about muscle spindles, the sensory receptors involved in the stretch reflex are muscle spindles. Each consists of a bundle of small specialized skeletal muscle fibers called intrafusal muscle fibers. This muscle spindle is surrounded by a larger skeletal muscle fibers called extrafusal muscle fibers. These fibers are responsible for resting muscle tone and at greater levels of stimulation for the contraction of the entire muscle. Both sensory and motor neurons innervate each interfusal muscle fiber. The dendrites of sensory neuron um, spiral around the interfusal uh, fiber in a central sensory region. Axons from spinal motor neurons from neuromuscular junctions on either end of this fiber. Muscle neurons innervating interfusal fibers are called gamma motor neurons. And their axons are called gamma efferents. An interfusal fiber has one set of myofibrils at each end, and these myofibrils run from the end of the interfusal fibers only to the sarcolemma in the central region that is closely monitored by the sensory neuron. The gamma efferents enable the CNS to adjust sensitivity of muscle spindle. Before seeing how this is accomplished, Let's see how the muscle spindle normally functions as a sensory receptor and then look at its effect on the surrounding extrafusal fibers. So the sensory neuron is always active, conducting impulses to the CNS. The axon enters the CNS in a dorsal route and synapses on motor neurons in the anterior ray horn of the spinal cord. Axon uh, collaterals di distribute the information to the brain, providing information about the muscle spindle. Stretching the central portion of the interfusal fiber distorts the dendrites and stimulates the sensory neuron, which increases the frequency of the axon potential generation. Compressing the central portion inhibits the sensory neuron, which decreases the frequency of the axon potential generation. The axon of the sensory neuron synapses on the CNS motor neurons that control the extrafusal muscle fibers of the same muscle. An increase in sensory neuron stimulation caused by stretching of the interfusal fiber increases the stimulation to the motor neuron controlling the surrounding extrafusal fibers, so muscle tone increases. This increase provides autonomic resistance that reduces the chance of muscle damage due to the overstretching. The patellar reflex and similar reflexes serve this function. A decrease in stimulation to the sensory neuron due to compression of the intrafusal fiber leads to a decrease in stimulation of the motor neuron controlling the surrounding extrafusal fibers, so the muscle tone decreases. This decrease reduces the re resistance um, to the movement that's underway. For example, if your elbow is flexed and you let gravity extend it, the triceps brachii muscle, which is compressed by this movement, relaxes. Many stretch reflexes are postural reflexes or reflexes that help maintain a normal upright posture. Standing, for example, involves a cooperative effort by many muscle groups. Some of these muscles work in opposition to one another, exerting forces that keep the body's weight balanced over the feet. If your body leans forward, stretch receptors in your calf muscles are stimulated. Those muscles then respond by contracting and returning your body to an upright position. If the muscles overcompensate and your body begins to lean back, your calf muscles will relax. But then stretch receptors in your muscles of your shins and your thighs are stimulated, and the problem is corrected immediately. Postural muscles generally maintain a firm muscle tone and have extremely sensitive touch receptors. As we as a result, very fine adjustments are continually being made, and you're not aware of the cycles of contraction and relaxation that occur. Stretch reflexes are the only type of postural reflex. There are many complex polysynaptic postural reflexes. So let's return now to the role of the gamma efferents. 
They let the CNS adjust the sensitivity of the muscle spindles. Gamma afferents play a vital role whenever voluntary contractions change the length of the muscle. Impulses arriving over gamma efferents cause the contraction of myofibrils and the intrafusal fibers as the biceps break the eye muscle shortens. The myofibrils pull on the sarcolemma in the central portion of the intrafusal fiber and the region monitored by sensory neurons until that membrane is stretched to normal resting length. As a result, the muscle spindles remain sensitive to any externally imposed changes in muscle length. For this reason, if someone drops a ball into your palm when your elbow is partially flexed, the muscle spindles automatically adjust to the muscle tone to compensate for the increased load. Speaking a little bit about polysynaptic reflexes, the polysynaptic reflexes can produce far more complicated responses than the monosynaptic reflexes can. For one, uh, one reason is that the inner neurons involved can control several muscle groups. Moreover, these inner neurons may produce either excitatory or inhibitory uh, postsynaptic potentials, or EPSP or IPSPs, at the CNS motor nuclei. As a result, the response can involve the stimulation of some muscles and the in inhibition of others. So the tendon reflex. The stretch reflex regulates the length of a skeletal muscle. The tendon reflex monitors the external tension produced during the muscle contraction and prevents tearing or breaking of the tendons. The sensory receptors for this reflex have not been identified, but they are distinct from both muscle spindles and proprioceptors in tendons. The receptors are stimulated when the collagen fibers are stretched to a dangerous degree, and these receptors activate sensory neurons that stimulate inhibitory inner neurons of the spinal cord. These inner neurons turn, in turn innervate the motor neurons controlling the skeletal muscle. The greater the tension in the tendon, the greater the inhibitory effect on motor neurons. As a result, a skeletal muscle can gener um, generally cannot develop enough tension to break its tendons. About withdrawal reflexes. The withdrawal reflexes move uh, affected parts of the body away from a stimulus. Painful stimuli uh, usually trigger the strongest withdrawal reflexes, but these reflexes are sometimes initiated by the stimulation of touch receptors or pressure receptors. The flexor reflex, a representative of the withdrawal reflex, affects the muscles of a limb. Um, I want you to recall that flexation or flexion reduces the angle between two articulating bones and that the contraction of flexor muscles perform this movement. So if you grab an unexpectedly hot pan on the stove, a dramatic flexor reflex will occur. When the pain receptors in your hand are stimulated, the sensory neurons activate inner neurons in the spinal cord that stimulate motor neurons in the anterior gray horns. The result is a contraction of flexor muscles that yanks your hand away from the stove. When a specific muscle contracts, opposing muscles must relax to permit the, uh, the movement. For example, flexor muscles that bend the elbow, such as the biceps brachii muscle, are opposed by extensor muscles, such as the triceps brachii muscle, that straighten it out. A potential conflict does exist, though. In theory, the contraction of a flexor muscle should trigger a stretch reflex in the extensors that would cause them to contract, opposing the movement. Inner neurons in the spinal cord prevent such competition through reciprocal inhibition. When one set of motor neurons is stimulated, those neurons that control antagonistic muscles are inhibited. The term reciprocal refers to the fact that the system works in both ways. When flexors contract, the extensors relax, and when the extensors contract, the flexors relax. Withdrawal reflexes are much more complex than any monosynaptic reflex. They also show tremendous versatility because the sensory neurons activate many pools of inner neurons. If the stimuli are strong, inner neurons will carry excitatory and inhibitory impulses down the spinal cord, affecting the motor neurons in many segments. The end result is always the same, a coordinated movement away from the stimulus. But the distribution of the effects and the strength of the character of the motor response depend on the intensity of the location of the stimulus. Mild discomfort might provoke a brief contraction in muscles of your hand and the wrist, but a more powerful stimuli would pr produce coordinated muscular contractions that affect the positions of your hand, your wrist, your forearm, and your arm. Severe pain would also stimulate contraction of your shoulder, the trunk, and the arm muscles. These contractions could last for several seconds due to the activation of reverberating circuits. In contrast, monosynaptic reflexes are invariable and brief. For example, the patellar reflex is completed in about 20 to 40 milliseconds. And lastly on this slide, the crossed extensor reflexes. The stretch tendon and the withdrawal reflexes involve ipsilateral reflex arcs. So the sensory stimulus and the motor response 
occur on the same side of the body. The cross extensor reflex involves contralateral reflex arcs because the motor response occurs on the opposite side of the stimulus. So speaking on some of the general characteristics of polysynaptic reflexes, polysynaptic reflexes range in complexity from a simple tendon reflex to the complex and variable reflexes associated with standing, walking, and running. Yet all polysynaptic reflexes share the following basic characteristics. They involve uh, pools of inner neurons. Processing takes place in pools of inner neurons before the motor neurons are activated. The result may be excitation or inhibition. The tendon reflex inhibits motor neurons and the flexor and cross extensor reflexes direct specific motor contractions. Two, they are intersegmental in distribution. The inner neuron pools extend across the spinal segments and may activate muscle groups in many parts of the body. Three, they involve reciprocal inhibition. Reciprocal inhibition coordinates muscular contraction and reduces resistance to movement. In the flexor and cross extensor reflexes, the contraction of one muscle group is associated within the inhibition of opposing muscle groups. Four, they have reverberating circuits, which prolong the reflexive motor response. Positive feedback between the inner neurons that innervate motor neurons and the processing pool maintains the stimulation even after the initial stimulus is faded. And five, several reflexes may cooperate to produce a coordinated controlled response. As a reflex movement gets underway, antagonistic reflexes are inhibited. For example, during the stretch reflex, antagonistic muscles are inhibited. In contrast, the tendon reflex, antastic antagonistic muscles are stimulated. In complex polysynaptic reflexes, commands that may be distributed along the length of the spinal cord, producing a well-coordinated response. Reflex motor behaviors happen automatically without instructions from higher centers. However, higher centers have profound effect on the performance of a reflex. Processing centers in the brain can facilitate or inhibit reflex motor patterns based on the spinal cord. Descending tracts are originating in the brain synapse on the inner neurons and motor neurons to the spinal cord. And these synapses are continuously active, producing EPSPs or IPSPs at the postsynaptic membrane. Speaking a little bit about voluntary movements and reflex motor patterns, spinal reflexes produce consistent stereotyped mo motor patterns that are triggered by specific external stimuli. However, the same motor patterns can also be activated as needed by centers in the brain. By making use of these pre-existing patterns, relatively few descending fibers can control complex motor functions. For example, neuronal pools in the spinal cord direct the motor patterns for walking, running, and jumping. The ascending pathway from the brain can provide appropriate facilitation, inhibition, or fine-tuning of the established patterns. This is a very efficient system that is similar to an order given in a military drill. A single command triggers a complex, predetermined sequence of events. Motor control involves a series of interacting levels. At the lowest level are monosynaptic reflexes that are rapid but stereotyped and relatively inflexible. At the highest levels, centers of the brain can modulate or build on reflexive motor patterns. So getting into reinforcement and inhibition. So a single EPSP may not depolarize the postsynaptic neuron sufficiently to generate an action potential, but it does make that neuron more sensitive to other excitatory uh, stimuli. Alternatively, an IPSP makes the neuron less responsive to an excitatory stimulation through the process of inhibition. By stimulating excitatory or inhibitory inner neurons within the brain stem or spinal cord, higher centers can adjust the sensitivity of reflexes by creating EPSPs or IPSPs at the motor neurons involved in the reflex responses. When many of the excitatory synapses are chronically active, the postsynaptic neuron can enter a state of generalized facilitation. This facilitation of reflexes can result in reinforcement or an enhancement of spinal reflexes. For example, a method used to overemphasize the patellar reflex is called the dendrastic maneuver. To do this, the subject hooks the hands together by interlocking the fingers and then tries to pull apart the hands while a light tap is applied to the patella. This reinforcement produces a big kick rather than a twitch. And this distinctive technique still produces a larger reflex response even when the individual realizes that it's just a distraction. If a stimulus fails to elicit a particular reflex response during a clinical exam, there can be many reasons for the failure. The person may be consciously suppressing the response, the nerves involved may be damaged, or there may be underlying problems inside the CNS. And the clinician may ask the patient to perform actions uh, that are designed to provide reinforcement, such as the dendrastic maneuver. Reinforced reflexes are usually too strong to suppress consciously. If the reflex still fails to appear, the likelihood of nerve or CNS damage is increased. And the clinician 
uh, or clinician may then order sophisticated tests such as nerve conduction studies or scans. So if you're not quite getting it, think about it in this way. Facilitation and inhibition are similar to what happens when a symphony conductor raises or lowers one hand to control the music volume while keeping the rhythm going with the, butt, uh, the hand that's holding the baton. And the basic pattern of beats doesn't change, but the loudness does. So other descending fibers have inhibitory effects on spinal reflexes. In adults, stroking the lateral sole of the foot produces a curling of the toes called the plantar reflex or the negative Babinski reflex after about a one second delay. In contrast, stroking an infant's foot on the lateral sole produces a fanning of the toes known as the Babinski sign or positive Babinski reflex. This response disappears as descending motor pathways begin to develop. If either the higher centers of the descending tracks are damaged, the Babinski sign reappears in an adult. As a result, clinicians often test this reflex when the CNS is injured and that is suspected in clinical exam.